So uh, the feedback that we got from your peers this week, I think is really, really helpful. As maybe, maybe the most important feedback that we've gotten so far on, on any of the designs that we've created, right? Uh, this is actionable feedback. So listen to what your peers are saying. Remember, this is a selfless process, this whole game design business. We're not making something that's enjoyable for us, okay? We're making something that's enjoyable for someone else. So honestly listen and incorporate the feedback that you got from your classmates today. It will make your game better, right? Don't assume that you know what you're doing, okay? And don't discount the experiences of the others that are around you, okay? <laughs> um, they, they are valuable. They add a nice layer of detail to the experiences that we're trying to craft because we're trying to make something that's fun and enjoyable, okay? Uh, this is hard, isn't it? Yeah. This is really hard, okay? So if you're struggling with this, you're amongst friends, okay? <laughs> if you're finding this process to be really wicked hard, you're amongst friends, okay? This is difficult. The design phase on every project is challenging, okay? Because what, ma what makes sense in here doesn't necessarily translate immediately to the visuals that are in front of you, okay? Um, admittedly, there's a tremendous amount of projection that has to happen for us to kind of understand the experience that you're trying to craft. Um, a good kind of direction to go in is be as clear as you can. Don't assume that your player understands the mechanic. I love my mother. She's the, the most important woman in my life, right? Uh, second, most uh, second most important woman in my wife. My wife, to my wife, second to my wife, right? Um, right? It's on, it's on the live stream, so I'm good. Uh, so she would be very, very okay with the statement that I'm about to make because we actually talk about this internally amongst the two of us very free frequently. Uh, my mom, just, just, she can't work computers. Okay, she is just like she just doesn't get it. She can't like figure it out. Like they just don't work for her, right? And she can't figure out how. You know, sometimes something as simple as just writing an email and sending an email, she just can't figure out. There's too many buttons. It's too much. Too much technology. It just doesn't work for her. There's too many steps in the sequence for her to remember to get this to work. Okay, uh, so whenever I design something on on a computer, I always say, okay, how would my mom work with this, right? How, what do I need to do to teach my mom how to work this experience that I'm making? What are the simplest moving parts and pieces that I need to communicate to my mom in order for her to be able to do this on her own? Okay. Don't assume that people have ever even played a video game before. We have to assume that they are first-time users that have never picked up a game controller ever. Okay, And that's where we begin. That's not necessarily where we're going to end. But that's where we're going to begin this process. Okay, so you heard it a couple times during the feedback that I was providing to the classmates. What do we need to teach? What do we need to explore? Right? How are we going to get them to understand X, Y, and Z and motivate their actions? Don't just assume. Okay, actually assume that they're they don't know anything about your game. I think that's a good perspective to take for this first level. Okay, game design for these first experiences is all about teaching. You have to teach them how to play your game. It's not always going to be like this because they're going to remember these experiences, hopefully. Okay, <laughs> they're going to hopefully they'll they'll learn something from the first moments of your game, and they'll take those experiences on with them to the next level. But this first experience has to be laser focused on teaching them the mechanics and teaching them what it's like to operate inside this world. Okay. Can we assume our player has Alzheimer's. <laughs> no, just assume that they've never done anything like this before. Okay. Assume that, you know, I'm a big Guitar Hero nerd. Like, I used to play a lot of Guitar Hero, right? Uh, I'm a, you know, I, I am a musician, or I was a musician at that, in that era, right? For the first, you know, I played the piano all the way up until I was about 20. Uh, all through junior high and high school, I was in jazz bands. Actually, in college, I was in a jazz band, too. So I was a classically trained musician. But when I picked up Guitar Hero, what was the first thing that they taught me how to do? play the guitar, right? And they did it in the most simple way possible, right? You know, there's one note. Every once in a while, it's like, okay, here's your one shot at getting it right. We're not going to make it super hard. All you have to do is figure out how to hit one button in time, right? They've distilled a very complex experience down into its simplest moving parts and pieces initially. And then you're on to the really crazy, the really crazy levels afterwards, right? So we'll get to that later. But these first experiences need to be wicked simple. 
One of the things that I would like you to do this week as we start to advance on to the next stage of this is to take a moment and start writing down everything that you've experienced that you need to build, right? Physically make a list. I need this. I need this. I need this. I need to figure out how to do X, Y, and Z, right? The moment you start writing it down, it becomes real, okay? And now you have you know, an itemized list that you can check off, right? One of the challenges that I see people kind of running into is they have these wonderful ideas, and there's a lot of parts and pieces to this idea, but very little of that has been materialized yet, and you don't know where to begin the next phase, right? Like, okay, I know I have to create this experience, but I don't know physically what the moving parts are to that experience. Start writing it down. Make yourself a laundry list of things that you need to build for your game. Yeah? Okay, so um, do you suggest having uh, texting there at the beginning to kind of... And we're going to go over that in a minute. That, you know, having some on-screen text in this early prototype stage is really going to help whomever's playing your game understand what's missing, what the experience is, without any sort of coding or scripting involved. It's going to be difficult for a lot of these interactions to come to life. Okay? So on-screen text is going to be a big helper, and we're going to go over that today, for sure. Okay. Um, what we're going through here is not something that's too dissimilar from what a classic game designer would do out there in the real world. Okay. Remember, you're not a coder. You're not a programmer. Okay. So there's no expectation that you completely go in and write code from day one. Okay. Good designers don't do that. They start thinking about you know, the experience, the core mechanics, uh, and the layout of, of, their, of their level that will hopefully help them achieve the experience that they're after. Okay? It's pretty bare bone for a long, long time, right? And the experiences that we've had today with our feedback is exactly what you'd see uh, in a development team where the designer's like, hey, come check out this level that I've prototyped. Let's see if it works. Do you guys have any ideas? What's, what's working, what's not working? Okay? Um, so I want you guys to take an opportunity uh, to reflect upon what you've created this week Start writing down the things that you're going to need to build. Okay, believe it or not, it's very, very helpful. Okay, this week we're going to continue flushing out a game. Okay, and it's important that we let's just travel over to the, the week three module. Okay, okay. yes. Uh, it worked both ways for me. When it was off the Interesting. Drive and when I it in. Interesting. Um, okay. So this week, we're going to be building our final prototype for this level. Okay? This final prototype should be pretty polished. But still remember, it's a prototype. Okay? It's supposed to be pretty bare bones. It's supposed to be pretty basic. This prototype should be representative of what it is that we're trying to create. I think representative is the word that I want you to underscore in your mind. Okay? It doesn't have to be a direct creation of your, of your idea. Representative. So if things are missing, that's OK. Things are going to be missing. Um, you know, if you want to go start flushing out some more you know, finely tuned 3D models, do that. Be it, have it be representative. Going back to Kevin's example earlier, start making a simple model of a gate. Okay? Start making a simple model of a wall. Figure out what that object's going to be that they're going to have to you know, put on fire. Start creating some geometry for that that's representative. Color plays a big role in our understanding of all these different visuals, okay? So at the very least, apply some simple, mat simple materials in Unity to everything, right? Everything gets their own material or a material of some kind. Don't have it just be gray, okay? Start visualizing and separating these things out with color. It makes a big, big difference in our understanding of the role of these things. As we were chatting with uh, Mike earlier about his concept, color has a big, or can have a big role and our understanding of game mechanics. So start introducing that pretty early on, like right now. Yeah. Part of the aesthetic is black and white, like silver and white, just to kind of. Okay. Using Val values of light. Values of light. Yeah. Okay. So we'll have to figure out a way to start communicating that, right? Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a challenge. Um, so we'll have to figure out a way to to. Yeah, we'll have to figure out a way to to simulate that in a way. Um, Mm -hmm. And you kind of grow in shape, and you get lighter as you progress. Interesting. So okay. You can go into more areas based off of things lighter or darker. All right. Interesting mechanic for sure. Right. For sure. Um, that's going to take some prototyping to figure out how we can how we can start introducing that. 
Um, start writing down the specifics of how you're going to be able to grow into the light or grow into a higher value. Um, that, that may be something to, to draw focus to pretty early yeah, on. Kind of like an engineering thing. My primary, my primary uh, engineering is on, uh, the, on the mechanics of doing rounds. So okay. That's my, like, that's my pie in the sky goal is to have that light value. But right. it's still like the aesthetic that I want. I want film grain, slightly kind of blurry, and then black and white. This is going to be a hot take, so I apologize. Aesthetics aren't really the, why we play games. So I like that you're, you have a good understanding of the, of the aesthetics in your mind. That's important. Uh, but put all your eggs in the, in, the, in the game design basket, right? Think about those mechanics first. Right. If we can get to the film grain thing, that's cool. That's like, that's like icing on the cake if it looks exactly the way we want it to look. People play games not because of how they look. Right. Sometimes that adds to the experience, but most often, often not, it's the other mechanics that, that give us the experience. Yeah, so. Right. It's, it really is. It's all about the gameplay. It really is. Okay. I mean, shoot, you don't have to look too far back to see really bad graphics in video games. You know, I grew up. I'm of the Atari generation, so I know some really, really, really bad graphics, right? I'm, a, yeah. You know, I, I one of my prized possessions is uh, uh, well, I forget which Atari it was, but it was one of the first Ataris, and it's the, I had the Empire Strikes Back cartridge from my Atari, right? And you had to do a lot of pretending in that era, right? Because we had one little, we had like, with like four pixels, that's all we had as a description of your little snow speeders. And I remember vividly that you had to, you know, wrap the cables around the, the big Imperial walkers. And then, you, you know, Luke Skywalker would zip up his little cable and blow up. The, but those, the representations of Luke Skywalker were probably five pixels, you know, you know all in cubes, by the way. So. It's in, and I loved it. I loved that game, right? That was a, there was a tremendous amount of imagination, right? And it kind of proves the point that it's not so much about the aesthetic, right? It's about the gameplay, right? That's what really creates the experience that we're after, okay? Um, so this is hopefully going to be the final prototype of our game. I want to talk about some UI things today that will help us create a little bit more of a polished presentation for our prototype. The outcome of this entire project is something that you should be able to show someone and say, Here's my idea. Let me walk you through it real fast. And there would be enough in that level, in that prototype, for them, for them to understand the core gameplay mechanics and the experience that you're trying to create. Okay? Um, that's the goal in all this. Everyone make sense? Yeah. yeah? All right. Let's jump over into Unity here real fast, and let's chat about a couple things that's going to help us start to flush out some of these ideas. Let's see. Ah, first things first, and this is a big time change. Actually, I'm going to rewind. I apologize. I'm going to redo my entire interface because personally, I find the default interface in Unity really frustrating. <laughs> and maybe it's because I'm an old school 3D guy and I'm right-handed and I want to have all my stuff on the right. Point being, customize your interface to make it work for you. Okay. I also like lists. This asset browser down here, that's cool, but it drives me crazy that I can't see like the total name of that folder. That drives me batty. It really does. So I want to make some changes to my interface. I'm going to take my entire project tab, and I'm going to left click and drag it over here to that side. And I'm going to put my console up here. And I'm also going to take my hierarchy, and I want to put it next, there we go, next to my project. Okay. That way, I can see pretty easily here my game view, my project tab, and my hierarchy. Okay. Now, since everything is kind of in these big vertical columns, for me, I want to make a small change to my project tab. That'll be done right there. I'm just going to go to the one column layout. And this makes me really happy, OK? Because now I get a list, almost like a tree view, of all the assets and the packages that are currently inside of my game. This is how I like to work. Um, you know, go crazy. Another thing that, that personally I like, and this is just kind of a workflow thing, is that it's really e easy for me to drag and drop things from my project directory over into my hierarchy pretty quickly. In addition, I can also select something in my hierarchy and see in the inspector all the properties surrounding that selection. So it just makes it, I don't know, it's just a flow for me that works. Okay? Everyone's a little bit different. What makes Unity a really strong game development platform is that it has a plastic interface. So use it. Change its layout. or you know, Make it work for you. You can't break it because up at the top of the screen, of course, there are a whole series of layouts 
You can even save your own layout and bring it with you wherever you want to go and load it in. And so make it work for you. Don't struggle and fight the interface. Okay, so with that in mind, let's start going here because it's a whole lot easier for me to see and understand all of my assets in this one column layout. Okay, and uh, I want you to look very carefully for a second under the hierarchy tab. What's the name of the of the scene file that I'm currently working in? Sample scene. This is new in this version of Unity. It used to be just untitled, I think. Where is the sample scene saved inside of your project directory? Yeah. Also, yeah, you had it. Yeah, be confident, Grant. Like, yeah, it is assets. No. Also a change, right? Also a change. Because in the older versions of Unity, we didn't have the scenes subfolder. Point being, the default scene is now called sample scene, and it's already been created and saved in your hierarchy. This is fundamentally different than how Unity used to work in the past. Here's my suggestion to you. Don't have it be called sample scene, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's probably not the, the best uh, foundation to build your house on. So I'm just do save as, file, save scene as, and of course, it's going to automatically be placed in the asset directory of your project, and I'll call this level 01. Okay. Since Unity is now coming with the scenes folder, I think it's a great, great practice to start placing all of your scenes in there. I think that's an awesome idea. I don't, you know, the sample scene, I really don't need or want that anymore. So I'm just going to choose to delete it. Bye. -bye. Okay. And I'm good to go. That's a good practice to get into. Okay. All right. I want to start crafting a couple things here. Let's make my a little bit smaller. Give me some more real estate. Here we go. Okay. I'm going to start just crafting a very, very simple environment. Okay. And I'm also going to add some cylinders. So I want to walk around and check out my universe a little bit here, my level, and we're going to start talking about some on-screen text elements that are going to be helpful. Earlier I mentioned that when we're doing these prototypes, color plays a big role in helping us understand the difference between items inside of our game. And if we're smart, as all of us are, we can use color to our advantage, right? People like to make visual connections between the, the things that are the same color. So uh, creating materials in Unity is important. Let's check it out. I want my cylinder thing. I don't know what this is. It's just a cylinder. I want it to be blue. Where can I go inside of my project tab to create a material? There's a couple wa ways that we can do this. Yeah, the create pull down menu. And uh, a lot of folks forget that this is here. Okay. There it is, material. Let's give this material a good name, like blue. Some people even go as far as creating a folder for their materials. I think that's a good practice. The more, organi uh, the more organized our asset folder is, the better, in my opinion. This materials folder is also something that you're going to see quite, quite instantaneously when you start importing models in for Moto. Okay. All right. So here's my blue material. Of course, let's make its albedo color blue. We get a new color picker instead of Unity, one that I'm really happy about because I really was not a huge fan of, of their previous color picker. Uh, if you've ever worked with a, a color picker that's, that's like this, this will feel at home for you. This outside ring will change your hue, okay? And then this inside circle is going to change the saturation and the value, okay? So I'm just going to pick a nice shade of blue. Point being, there's two things that we have to adjust in here to change the color. All right, and now I've made that material blue. Okay, how can I apply that blue material over here to my object? Just drag and drop. It really is that easy. There it is, and now it's blue. I want to duplicate this entire thing. Oh, so I just create a new material. Horrible with lists. Call this. Uh, floor. I want to make it, oh, I don't know, just a, a nice, a nice off-white. 
something in there. One of the things I've learned with working inside of Unity is you, you want to get things out of that standard white color as fast as you can. The lighting setups that you're going to be working with in Unity are influenced directly uh, when everything is white, right? You, you get a bad read as to the lighting. Come on now. They probably applied it, but it's so small. Yep, it did apply it. It was just so faint and so influenced by my directional light that I couldn't see what was going on. Do you see that? See how we really don't even, that, you know, if you look at the color of this, oops, I apologize, I didn't mean to click off of it. If you look, look at the color of this, yeah, if it's even close to white, it just gets blown out by that directional light. So we gotta have either a pretty extreme color green for grass, or we got to start dialing down our, uh, the influence of our directional light. Okay, let's keep cruising here. Here's my cylinder. I want to put copies of these inside the corners of my environment. That's pretty helpful, just allows me to see and understand spatially where I'm at. Uh, I'm going to duplicate that entire shape. Select both of them, Command D once again to duplicate those two cylinders. Yeah, there we go. I like that, and I think on one level, on one area of my level, uh, I'm just going to place just a cube. Let's reset the transformations on my cube, so it goes right to the origin of my scene, and that way I can see what's going on. Voila. Let's play my game. Well, I don't have a controller yet, so I gotta put uh, my character controller in. I've already loaded the character's asset package into the game, and I'm just gonna use the first person character controller. I'll use rigid body. That way I can interact with things if I so chose. Let's give it a good starting location. We definitely don't want it inside the red. So we'll put it over here. Now, has anyone noticed what happens when you put your, your character controller, like out over here, off the edge of the map? What happens? Yeah, you fall forever. So you got to be mindful of that. There I go. Just gonna fall for. Is this what's gonna happen? Uh, what's gonna happen? Is anything gonna happen? No, you're literally just gonna fall forever. Yeah, this is it, right? So we have to go in and manually program, and we'll talk about how to do that in the upcoming weeks, how to uh, make like a death zone, okay? So that, <laughs> so you don't fall from ever. Point being, just make sure your game controller's on the level before you play your game. There you go. Now I've turned off the influence, or I've turned off the auto generation of my light maps. Um, you know, you certainly could go in and just bake your light maps pretty quickly. We were talking about that earlier. I'm just going to generate them real fast. I only got a couple objects, and it took about two seconds to do it. And now my game, now I can see all the shadows and what have you. Yep, there we go. And that now is starting to come to life a little bit, which I like. Starting to feel it. Rock and roll. Even jump. Life is good. All right. So one of the things that we're going to do, need to do for a lot of our prototypes in the game world is, is start to communicate to our players um, or to someone on the development team with text some major idea, a major component, right? Now the UI system inside of Unity is actually pretty cool, but I want to have maybe like some sort of text badge or some sort of on-screen text over by like maybe one of these pillars, and maybe I want to have another one on top of my red mountain, okay? Maybe each one of these is going to tell us something important to the mechanics of the game, right? So, I start my game, maybe like this one over here will say, go to the top of Red Mountain, right? So now I know that I need to go over here, go to the top of Red Mountain, which I can't get to at the moment, so let's fix that. And I'm going to do it with uh, just another 3D cube. Here we go, actually. Command D, now I got two of them, I'll make this one smaller. I bet you anything that will, that will do it. 
Nope. This is why we play test, right? You make something. Ah, I need one more. There we go. Let's see what that gets us. Da 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 da. Well, oh, hold on a sec. I'm horrible at jumping. Well, something is stopping me from jumping up there. At times, this happens. I can't see what my game controller is. Uh, what my game controller is doing, and when we have our game tab over here in its unique viewport. It's difficult to get a good sense. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my game tab. I'm going to drag it down to the bottom of my interface. That way I can see the game, but I can also see the editor at the exact same time. Let's play the game, Command-P. So now I'm looking at the editor. Uh-oh. What is going on? Why is it not? Is it the? Yeah, look, my rigid body, my capsule collider is getting stuck on the inside of these things. There we go. Okay, so that's a problem. That's something that I'm gonna have to debug and fix, but at least I now know what the problem is. That capsule collider when I'm jumping is penetrating inside to my mesh. These little cubes may not have enough resolution geometrically for the colliders to get the collision information that I'm after. But I, now I know the problem, right? And that's really thanks to being able to see the scene view up here and the game view downstairs at the exact same time. All right, so let's go ahead and start getting that on-screen text to appear. And there's a couple different ways that we can do this, okay? I want to show you some of the limitations and some of the problems with these different options, because certain options are custom made for certain scenarios. Um, let's uh, kind of return to a second from where we ended in GCOM 424, which was the UI elements inside of Unity. Check this action out, okay? So I want to have, like I said, a little badge, some on-screen text over here by this blue cylinder that says go to top of Red Mountain or something to that regard. Okay. Yeah, exactly, right? So of course, naturally, we can just add that game object into our scene. So game object, UI. Here are all the different UI elements that we can create. And last semester, inside of GCOM 424 or in other instances of GCOM 424, we talked about the role of this text option. So let's go ahead and add it in. Now whenever you add a text element, a text UI element inside the scene, there's some new things that pop up pretty quickly inside the Unity Editor. Okay, And uh, it's humongous on mine. Yeah, This is your canvas. Okay, This canvas is where all of your on-screen UI elements are going to be drawn. Okay, In every sense, it's kind of a visualization of your current screen size. Now look at mine, it's kind of a square, okay? It's a square because this viewport here is also a square. It's looking at the current scene size, or excuse me, the current screen size of my 3D scene to develop the size and shape of my canvas, okay? Let me prove it to you. If I put my game view back down here at the bottom of the tab, Look what happens to that same canvas size. It shrinks, and now it's a small little rectangle inside the 3D view of my scene. Okay? So this white frame, the canvas, is always, always, always going to be a representation, a direct representation of the size of your screen, the aspect ratio of your screen. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. See how it changes its shape, its aspect ratio, as I make my screen size larger or smaller? So here's what I'm going to do to fix this problem and to make it a little bit more predictable. I'm going to change the aspect ratio of my game build to something that's a little bit more defined. Now all of these computer screens in here, I can't remember, they're either 16 by 9 or 16 by 10. If you look at the actual dimensions of the screen, you can, you can see that pretty quickly if you look at the, the, the resolutions and what have you. Um, most you know, most uh, computer screens these days are going to be 16 by 9 or 16 by 10. Point being, you got to know the aspect ratio of the device that you're building this game for so that you can set 
the UI elements to correctly go to that world. I'm just going to put 16 by 9. And now, no matter how large or small I make my screen, at the very least, the aspect ratio of my canvas is staying the same, which is what we're after. Okay. So what we see here in our canvas, let me zoom in, is a representation of our computer screen. Now I have my actual text element in the bottom right, or bottom left hand corner of my screen, and you look very carefully down there. Here it is, new text. Okay. So here's the challenge, or here's what this system is built for. The on-screen UI system is really meant for uh, UI that goes over our screen, not in our 3D view. Even though we can do that, it breaks down pretty quickly, okay? And you're not going to get a really solid result. The UI elements, the UI game objects in Unity are really meant for classic UI, not in-game text that will move around in a local, localized 3D space, okay? Um, let me show you what I'm talking about. I can actually force it to do what I'm wanting it to do, but uh, it gets pretty poor pretty quickly. This canvas in here is important for me. If you change the size, rotation, and location of your canvas, all of its children will also get moved around. And it's pretty, it's pretty big. And uh, oh, I forgot I need to make one change. So the render mode is in screen space. Let's do world space. Okay. Now I can push and pull this thing around. It's way too big. Let's get it down here. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, the little cube here in the center. Perspective, orthographic. Another lifesaver that a lot of folks uh, forget about is the role of the F key inside of Unity. What's F do? Find or frame the selected game object inside of your, inside of your editor. So if I'm like way out over here, hitting the F key will automatically go right to it. All right, so I think if I remember correctly. Yeah, let's get this way out over here. I'm going to scale it down even more. I'm going to put it right above that blue. Um, what, what did you change the render mode to? Uh, world space. World space. Yeah. So I can move it around. If it's on screen space, it's just going to be a lockdown UI that's only going to appear uh, on top of your screen. All right. Let's see. This is where it gets pretty fun. Yeah, because look how small my text is now. It's wee, it's itty bitty. It's also flipping the wrong way. There we go. And now I can make my text elements a little bit bigger. Okay, make this bigger. You can even change if you want. actually. I need to make that bigger, and then I also need to make the font size probably a little bit bigger so it draws correctly in there. So we'll put go to red mountain. Turn back. Yeah, turn back now. Beware. Return the flag. I was thinking that the whole time. That's why I said it like that. That's why I said it like that. All right. We'll get to that. Okay, this is the underpinning of pop-up notifications. It really is. Okay, we're not going to go into the scripting of of getting them to appear and disappear today, but that that will happen. How do you shrink down your canvas? Just, just with the scale tool. Yeah, you can try this one. Rec transform transform. That will change its size as well. But mine was, mine was working with the scale tool. Are you recording this? I am recording this, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's play the game real fast and see how this works. See if it is, in fact, well, hey, look at that. Go to Red Mountain. Okay. 
Now, the good thing about the Canvas system, okay, in the built-in game object and UI game objects is that they're very easy to script and they're very easy to incorporate inside of a larger like trigger-based system, okay? There's some advanced stuff that allows us to activate and deactivate and you know, have parameters change. It's pretty good. I like it, okay? However, when we're just trying to prototype, this kind of gets in the way, okay? Because there's the complex machine, canvas, different text elements. It can be a thing, and also at times, the quality can get pretty poor if we're not minding our business here, okay? I've made my canvas pretty small, but in order to make this in here pretty legible, let me select it again real fast. Oops, I'm still playing the game. Command P. Here we go. I had to make the font size a little bit bigger. Okay. Try real hard to stay away from really small font sizes or really humongous font sizes. It's kind of a limiter. We're kind of making the UI system work, but we're we're doing something that's really not designed to do. Yeah. So what would be better? Yeah. So. So that, you know, you, we could go that route, okay? And that was, you're reading my notes, because that, that's the next natural step in this. It's like, oh, I can just make a texture or something, right? Okay? Maybe I can texture map something. I can texture map a polygon with some directions on that polygon. That will work. But we don't necessarily have to do that. Let me show you specifically what I'm talking about. Right. Yeah. Is there a button just to, like, if you're working in an editor, just to hide something? Just like... Yeah. I'm not sure if there's a button, but this is how you turn it on and off. Oh. Yeah. This is enable, game object enable, game object disabled. Oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. I would feel bad if you learned nothing, right? Um, so let me show you another alternative. This is usually the, 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 the next thing that people think of. I'll make a texture, or I'll make a piece of 3D geometry, and I'll texture map it, okay? There's some problems with that, but you can do it, okay? I'm going to open up Photoshop real fast, and I'm just going to make a very, very simple texture. If you wanted to do this, this is fine, right? Um, but there's also some other awesomeness that I want to show you that will, that will give you another tool that you can use, OK? All right, so here we are in Photoshop. I'm simply just going to make a very simple 512 by 512 pixel document. And I'm just with my texture tools, or my text tools, excuse me. I don't know what. Go, let's make it not white, the text. Let's make it red. Go to red. Yeah. I want to keep it really wicked simple for today. Okay, I'm going to get rid of the background, so now it's on top of trans a transparent background. Okay, this transparency is important. Okay, so I'm not I'm not loading or I'm not creating a texture uh, that has pixels for the background transparent in the background. So let me save this out. I'm going to save it as a PNG. Oh, come on, folks. Yeah, here we go. Just want to make sure that transparency is on. There we go. Export all. Just put it on my desktop. I'll call this Photoshop Texture. Let's put it right there on my desktop. Now, I want to load this texture into Unity. Okay. So I've created an asset. If you look at my desktop, there it is. So how do I get this asset? Created externally into Unity. You just drop it in the assets folder. That's fine. That will actually work. Okay. There's another way we can do it. Of course, we can. Yep. Do it in the actual project directory itself. If you right-click on the background here, you can import in a new asset. Look at your OS Finder. I put mine on my desktop, so we just travel over there real fast and double-click on it to load. Now, when we're working with textures, there's um, some import procedure that we need to follow to ensure that Unity is reading this texture correctly. Now, I went out of the way and, and emphasize that this texture has a transparent background, right? I want to ensure that that transparency comes through, okay? 
I got my texture selected and over here in my inspector, there's some things in here that I want to make sure that we change. First and foremost, I definitely want to change the texture type from default to maybe sprite, okay? 2D and UI, this is a good practice to get into, especially if you're just trying to get text into the scene, okay? Um, let's do it real fast. Things change, which is pretty great. Um, now, if this was actually uh, you know, a piece of vector graphics, we can. there's some benefits in there. Um, I just want to make sure, let's see, sprite, all this stuff I don't need. I don't need to necessarily generate the physics of it. Um, well, no, um, this is just a single, well, no, this is just a single image on this, it's just a single sprite. Because right. oftentimes when you create a sprite sheet, there's a whole bunch of images inside of that one, it the and it just moves the position, right? So then we'll have to go look at multiple, or even polygon, which allows us to make a custom shape for our sprite that will move. So, yeah, it's pretty neat. Um, okay, most of, for what I'm doing, all of this stuff just stays at its defaults. Uh, this is quality stuff. Yep, just hit apply. Boom, and check it out. The moment that we hit apply, because we changed its texture type from default to texture or to sprite 2D UI, aha, we get all of our transparency in there. And now it becomes a little bit more easy for us to use. In addition, so you can even just drop it in your scene. There it is. Okay, we're on our way. You don't have to tag it to a canvas or another existing game object. It's just a texture like any other texture uh, that we can place inside the scene. So it makes it very easy. I guess that's the point that I'm trying to make. Now this is a relatively unintelligent object at the moment. We can't, you know, we can script it obviously, okay. It's still going to work just like our other UI element. Still looks pretty good as it gets closer to it. It moves around the scene in parallax, just like we'd expect it to see. However, what are some of the challenges that are associated with this very thing? Is there an outer glow to this? That's, a, just that's, that's lighting and visual effects. You can do that, but that's not associated with what we're trying to do here. Can you get the uh, text box or the text size? Yeah, so change in this thing is darn near impossible, right? To make any change to my text, I now have to go all the way back to Photoshop, okay? Make the change. Export it out, you know, hopefully we'll update. If I was very careful, I named it the same and, you know, put in the same location, Unity will update, okay? But that's very much a machine in the way, okay? So maybe I wanted to say go to mountain instead of go to red, okay? It's just Texas, go to mountain, that's not right. Go to mountain oh, I wish, that's just the rule for everything, right? So I've made a change to it. Let's export it out as again as a PNG. Now, check it out. I'm going to actually name it the exact same thing, but I'm not going to put it back on my desktop. This is a cool thing about working inside of Unity. If we, when we import an asset into Unity, where does it actually go? Yeah. Now, my project directory is called test. Here's my assets folder. And there it is, Photoshop Texture. So I'm going to place it in the Unity project directory. I'm going to name it the exact same thing that I previously named. So when I hit Save, I'm overwriting the file that's currently existing in Unity. But the benefit of this is that when I go back into Unity, it updates for me. Okay? So I don't have to re-import it and reinsert it back into my scene. Everything just kind of cascades like it's supposed to, which is pretty rad. Okay? You know, these little textures and these sprites, these are neat. I mean, there's a lot of functionality and there is a purpose for them, okay? But for what we're trying to do, it's kind of a system in the way. There's a better option here, okay? And it involves us downloading one of the new elements found in, in Unity 3D and it's TextMesh Pro, okay? TextMesh Pro is a really great tool. If you go into the asset store, um, TextMesh Pro, there it is, okay? It should be installed, and I want to put should be installed, okay? Um, but 
make sure if it's not now you know where to go to find it it's on the asset store it's part of the free bundle of uh, resources that are available to us um, I believe it to already be installed on mine yeah because here it is under the UI oops excuse me so there's two ways you can do it you can create it from the 3d object menu or you can do it under UI I'll just do it in the 3d object since I'm here now the benefit of this, okay, oh, get the importer, it says, this appears to be the first time you access Text Mesh Pro. Do you want me to install it? Yeah, I want you to install it, okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's an asset package, just like any other asset package. It's a pretty light package, which I'm thankful for. Let's get rid of this popover now. If you look over in your asset directory, there it is. It's a whole bunch of stuff. It's a pretty deep, deep app. It's, it's a really great resource. On the surface, though, what it allows us to do is kind of a hybrid of, of the two systems that we previously solved. So, uh, we saw we get the flexibility of the built-in UI system, but we get the ease of use of just a simple little sprite, a simple little uh, text asset that we saw with the element that we created in Photoshop. So let's create it again. It's going to be, of course, right there at the origin. We get this little bit of... Uh, it's a little bit of uh, stuff over here in your inspector, and yay, I'll put yay. Okay. Now, what's powerful about this system is that, of course, naturally we get to change any of the text inside of Unity, which means that we can program this text inside of Unity. Okay. And we'll see that once we start getting into the programming world. Uh, if it shows up in the inspector, we get to access that through code. So that means I can change all of my on screen or any text input or any text field in my game programmatically, which is cool. Okay, we'll get to that later on. We can also change how it looks interactively down here. You can load in different fonts, different font styles, colors, and what have you. You can actually change, give it material properties, even thickness, which is rad. So you can make 3D text pretty quickly. It's a really neat system, and I encourage you to play around with it. Um, let's see. Go back. Yay. Oop, why does it still say sample text? Do I have two? I have two of them in here. That's why. Yay. Cool, huh? Yeah, it's a really neat system. These on screen controls, kind of like our UI system, will determine where this text element's going to show up. So it's kind of like a, a it's the best of both worlds. It's highly editable inside the Unity editor um, and allows us to very quickly make changes uh, and place it inside of our 3D environment because it really is true 3D text. And you can even extrude it out and make it true 3D text versus 2D text appearing inside of a 3D world, which is pretty rad. So I'll let you guys explore that on your own. There's some great, some great learning resources that will take you in, into that direction if you so chose. Okay. All right, so that's, those are our text options inside, inside of Unity. Now, when it comes to like in-game text, little badges and icons or whatever that you want to use to communicate a game mechanic, like with Michael's example, having a little text element on screen just in the prototype stage saying, find the red crystal to open this gate will help people figure out maybe what you need to do next. We saw some examples of that earlier as well, or some on-screen text would be helpful at the prototype stage in uh, you know, letting people understand what they need to do. So I definitely encourage you guys to start putting this stuff in. We will get to a point, once we're ninja programmers, on how we can make these things appear and disappear uh, when we get to a certain distance or when a certain event occurs. We can have these things pop on and on and off. Okay, Make them a little bit more interactive too. So we'll get to that point. That's a little bit later on. Now for um, our homework this week, I mentioned earlier that this is going to be kind of like a little polished prototype, right? With the idea that, you know, if you're, this is, this is, this is the go-to example, if you're in an elevator with like the CEO of Blizzard Activision, right? You should be able to hand them this prototype and say, this is my idea, what do you think, right? So a little bit more polished presentation than just kind of a raw Unity file. So I want to talk to you uh, and kind of refresh everyone's memory on how we can create an interface, right? and start adding some scripting components to our interface that will make it truly a workable UI, okay? 
And that's how we're going to kind of end our conversation today was, is with this interface. Let's just check it out. It's pretty easy to make. Uh, big picture, pie in the sky, prototyping idea is that I need to have two different scenes. My first scene is going to be my interface. My second scene is going to be Red Mountain here. Okay. So I'm going to physically craft another scene file. So file, new scene. Okay. Oh, yep, I want to save the scene that I'm in. And of course, naturally, we're going to be good stewards. We're not going to leave this scene titled untitled. So let's do save as. Let's give it a good name. Let's call this one main menu. It's going to be placed inside my assets directory, but I want to place it inside my scenes directory. There we go. We've got level one, main menu. It's starting to make lighting and reflection data for all of the level one stuff. That's, that's what happened when I hit the generate light map button. It started to make all that stuff for me. So here I am in main menu, and I want to start to go in and create a simple little UI. Okay? For this type of user interface, the built-in GUI stuff that, that Unity gives us is probably the best thing to use, right? Let's add it in, game object, UI, and I'm just going to use some text. And it automatically creates the canvas for us. Okay, canvas, text, and the event system. This event system is going to be the thing that we access um, for us. It's the thing that really kind of understands when we're clicking on buttons or scrolling or mousing over things. So it's an important part of the back end of the, uh, of the UI system. Okay. So in the, there it is. There's my text. I didn't zoom out enough. All right. First and foremost, let's change the color of our background because I don't want to see just that, brrr, that gradient in the background. That's getting boring. It's getting dull. I certainly don't want to use it. I want to put something a little bit more stimulating in this space. Okay. If you look at the different components that we can add inside, or excuse me, the different game objects that we can create inside of our Canvas system, there's a whole bunch. Okay. Check it out. I got my Canvas selected. This is eventually going to be my play button, but let's create a background first and then we'll start putting the play buttons on top. Okay. So inside of my Canvas, let's go ahead and add uh, well, anyth anything. You can just put an image in there. Uh, well, shoot. I mean, you can do so much with these with these options. Let's just do an image. Okay, bless you. There's the image. We want all the children of my interface to be, or all the game objects of my interface to be a child of this canvas parent. So keep that in mind. We don't want to have like eight canvases. We want one canvas with eight different sub game objects inside of it, right? So here's the image. Okay. Let's just change its color to something other than white. How about a nice shade of blue? I'm in a blue mood today. Not because I'm sad. I just like blue. Okay, I changed my mind. Sometimes I change my mind, mind like the weather. I'm just going to make it gray so it's real easy to see in the live stream. Okay. Uh, this image, however, and as all the other game objects you'll see inside of our canvas size, or inside of our canvas, has a defined size. And that defined size is really established by this height and width. Okay. So if I want to make that image go the full width of my, of my canvas, I can just interactively do that here. Okay, move those sliders, which is cool. You can also hit the Rec Transform tool, which is this one. Okay, goes a little faster. Even snap to things too, which is kind of nice. Boop. Awesome. Ha ha! Wonderful. Now we have an unlit gray background. Okay, which is pretty cool. However, where did my text go? Yeah, it's actually sharing the exact same space. Yeah, it's not really behind it. It's in the exact same space, right? And it's being clipped by the, the big gray background. So we need to start kind of pushing some of this stuff in and out a little bit so we can get what we're after. Now, I'm going to grab my image, and let's see, will it do, yep, let's see. And just to make sure that it is, in fact, being drawn, let's put it in the center. Yep. 
you know what? We are totally looking at the backside. <laughs> so I have, I have done what I didn't want to do. Why is that still not showing up? No. I had it on the right side a minute ago. Oh, awesome. Oh, excuse me. I had the wrong thing selected when I was trying to move it. Hmm. It's blocking everything. Uh, source image. Oh, maybe it's because it doesn't have a... Maybe because it's not doesn't have an image in here. It's not drawing correctly. We're gonna come back to this. We'll come back to this. I want to keep going here. I'm just gonna turn it off for the time being, and we'll focus on the text because the programming of the text is really what's most important today. And if we have time less time left in class, I'll uh, debug my image, get that working. But I want this text to be the most important part. Okay. Now, with interfaces inside of Unity, this bounding box on the, on the text object itself is, it plays a specific role. Not only does it define where the on-screen characters are going to be, but it also determines the interactivity of this button. Because I'm going to make a button, right? I want to make a button that we can click on. Okay. All right. So I get to move it around anywhere I want. Let's make this the play button. Whoops. Let's make it significantly bigger. Increase the font size. And here's kind of a cool little trick about working uh, with the Unity text, text tools. I made this font size pretty big, right? It's outside of the box, but that's OK. Because if we just turn the, uh, the vertical overflow to, or the vertical overflow to overflow, same with the horizontal overflow, now it'll pop up no matter where our little bounding box is, which is kind of cool. There we go. Oops, let's make it a, we'll leave it white for the time being, and then we'll come back in and continue messing with it here in a minute. So the goal of this, of this object is to have it be a button. But right now, if you look at how this object is created, it's just text. There's nothing inside of this game object that's really going to tell the computer that this is something that we should be registering when we click on it. There's nothing that tells the computer, hey, remember where my mouse cursor is, so that when I click on it, it actually fires off a script. Okay. We need to add an additional game component to this game object. And it gives us a nice little reminder here that inside of Unity, everything is a game object first, and then we add component pieces on top of those game objects to make them more complex. Let's add a component. And as one might imagine, we're going into the UI section, and we're going to add the button component. That guy right there. Now, with this button component added into the scene, check it out. We have some more options, including a color tint. Okay? Uh, we get to choose which colors the computer is going to tint this button when I roll over it. Let's prototype this real fast and see how, uh, see how we can make it work. So the normal color is going to be white. The highlighted color, uh, let's just make it uh, red. Okay? And the pressed color will make it a fun shade of yellow. Okay? Let's play the game, see if it works. There it goes. Now, why is it only registering that event when I roll in from the top? Can you guys see my mouse cursor? See, it doesn't actually do it down here. Yeah, if you remember, each one of these text components comes with a, with a defined kind of bounding box. Let me grab it real fast, OK? See how the box is way up here? This box, this gray box, is where, you're, where the computer is going to register your mouse. Okay? So if I want the entire button to be selectable, okay, I need to make this box bigger. And this allows us to, once again, influence the power of the Rec Transform tool. It takes a little bit of work in sometimes. Something like that. That's good enough. Let's play it now, see if we get the action that we're after. Ha! And when I click, it clicks. Okay? So at the very least, we know the button's working, but it's not really doing anything yet, right? We've got to get to actually do something. Welcome to computer coding. Okay? Our journey into programming begins today, right? Bum, bum, bum.
Yeah, but it's, it's going to be pretty easy stuff, okay? But we're going to crack it open a little bit and start getting our hands dirty. Say again? Easy. We can do it. It's actually not as bad as one might think. Okay, I'm going to stop my game, Command P, and I'm going to go in and start creating some scripts. Okay. All right. Inside of Unity, we need to create fundamental code for almost every level of interactivity that we need to create. That's one of the areas that makes the game design industry pretty challenging is that nothing comes for free with us. Everything, and I mean everything, requires a couple of lines of code. Shoot, opening a door in a game requires like eight lines of codes and four animation clips and a whole series of conditions. It's not as easy as it looks, right? Actually, it's pretty hard in comparison. Now, I hope to, uh, to give you guys a nice, simple foundation in programming. At the conclusion of this module and this class, you should have kind of a casual understanding of how all this stuff works. At the very least, you should be able to get a script, look at it, and understand the basic language of the code, okay? Kind of understand, you know, just kind of on the surface, if you will, what is actually happening. Being able to see all the different functions and start to go from there. All right, so let's create our code. Now, we're going to do all of our coding in here in C Sharp, okay? Which is a great, great programming language. It's kind of an industry standard programming language. It's being used all over the place at every single level. There's not a better programming language for you to learn, okay? You're going to find that all the Unity documentation is very well commented in C Sharp, so you're going to get a tremendous amount of support and helping you understand what this whole C-sharp thing is all about. So check it out. Let's do it, C-sharp. Let's make our first script. Now, we have to be laser focused with the name of the script. When it comes to programming, we just can't do whatever the hell we want to do, okay? We've got to be specific, and we have to be mindful of what we're creating, okay? So, I'm going to call this button, or this uh, controller, the play. I'm going to call this script the play button controller. That's what happens when you speak and type, type and teach at the same time. Things come out all jarbled. If you look very carefully at how I'm putting, or how I'm naming this, what don't you see in here? There's three words, but what don't you see in between them? Spaces, okay? We know like you the spaces, okay? We know like you the spaces inside of, inside of the computer coding world. Why, does anyone know why? Spaces have meaning, okay? In sub-web servers, uh, a space determines the beginning of the next file, okay? So a space is a character in the computer programming world, right? We don't put spaces in file names to ensure that wherever this file lands, it won't be misinterpreted, okay? All right. Now, when you click on, when you click on your, your script inside of your asset directory, you're going to get a viewer over here, okay? This is not a text editor inside of your inspector. So this is allowing us very quickly to see the code. We can't change the code here, okay? This is just a viewer. So let's go ahead and start actually changing the code. Our IDE, our integrated development environment, is called Visual, Visual Studio. Let's do it. If you double click on your script, Visual Studio is going to load. It's way down here at the bottom. If you took uh, GComp24 with us, actually, last semester or a year ago, we weren't using Visual Studio, right? What, what were we using? Mono Develop. Mono Develop. Yeah, Mono Develop is gone. Visual Studio is the new king, which is actually <laughs> really good, in all honesty, because Mono Develop was, it was not good. It was not good. Actually, it wasn't horrible, but it was not as strong as Visual Studio. Does anyone know who develops Visual Studio? Microsoft, right? This is their primary code environment for all things Microsoft. So we're in good company. We're in a, we're in a, uh, a development environment that's, uh, that's pretty strong. And it just came out for the Mac, which is pretty nice. Yes, sir? Um, so what key would you need to get rid of, like an actively imported, if you want to do this? And how do you just remove? Like, I thought for a year now it was like it's completely obsolete. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work, yeah. So, like for me right here, just right click on it, oh. delete. Yep. Okay, so let's go back over into Visual Studio. And, hello. 
loading, loading. It's the first time Visual Studio's launched on this machine. Come on now. Yeah. It should just load what's called your solution, okay? Your solution is really your project directory. If you look over here, check it out. This is the name of my project directory. This is the name of my game. It's called test, okay? Here's the assets folders, materials, scenes, standard assets, text mesh pro, and here's the play button controller that I just created back over in Unity. So there's a direct link between this solution inside of Visual Studio and our game, which is pretty nice. It makes editing and working organically in Visual Studio really, really easy. So the left-hand side of your screen is always going to be kind of like a file browser, a way for you to navigate between all the, different, all the different chunks of code and scripts that you're using inside your game. However, this over here is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we're going to be physically doing all of our coding. Now, when it comes to coding, is this magic? No. What is it? What is code? It's just text. Yeah, there's just instructions. That's all it is, right? Sometimes people hear code and they think that we need to go to like Hogwarts and get like a wizard degree or something. No, it's just text. That's all it is, right? It's just text that our computer understands, okay? It's just instructions. Now, I'm going to ask you guys to do something that's going to be wicked hard, okay? For some of you, okay? For some of you, it's going to be hard. And that's, I need you to start thinking like a machine, okay? What does the machine do? Follow instructions. That's all it does. A machine is only ever going to follow the instructions that it's provided unless it's like some crazy, like artificial intelligent, you know, machine that's going to like wipe out humanity or something like that, right? Sorry, boys. I can't let you do that. Exactly, right? <laughs> Those are the machines that we should be really worried about, right? All right, so look, there's an update, I think. Uh, I'm not going to update. I'm going to close this because what we're doing is really not that high end. But let's start looking at the text of our script and start understanding how we're going to write our code and how we're going to participate in this new environment. Okay. So if we start at the top, every machine is going to start with the first line, and then it's just going to start going down one row at a time. So what we're doing here in the first three lines is that we're telling the, we're telling the computer which basic code libraries that we're accessing. Okay? We're loading in some stuff on the back end. Okay? We have to have them so we know which libraries to access and which libraries to use. So the first three lines, those kind of come for free. Keep them in there. Don't ever delete them. Okay, uh, everything works really well when you direct Unity towards the correct code libraries. Okay, okay. Now this next stuff, this is where it gets pretty. This is where it gets pretty fun, right? Because now we're, uh, if you look carefully here, now we're starting to define what this script, what this specific script is going to be doing, and what specific code library this script is going to be using. Right now. Check it out. It says play button controller. Did, I didn't write that. Where did that come from? The title. The, yeah, the name of the script. Okay. We want to make sure that each script is named uniquely and differently from another script. Because often in the future, we're going to be trading information back and forth between scripts. The computer is going to get very confused if we have two scripts that are named the exact same thing. Actually, you're going to find those are called compiler errors, and it goes, uh, I'm not going to work. Yeah. You can't use the same script twice for a different door? We can, but we gotta if we can't have two two different scripts named play button controller. It's gotta be like door number two. Like right. If 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 play button controller two is doing a different set of actions, we have to make sure that it's is named separately. As long as they're named differently. As long as they're named differently, the code could be identical. Say again? Uh, yeah, you won't even allow to play the game if you have two scripts that are named the same thing. Yeah. All right. These in here are called functions. Okay. Functions are kind of containers for instructions. Okay. But these are, say again? A little bit. Yeah, classes. Yep. Our functions are kind of special though. Okay. Because certain functions are going to be activated at certain times inside of our game. Okay. Now, if you think of the, if you think of these functions kind of like buckets or containers or briefcases, when is the start function going to be fired off? 
at the start of the game, right? The moment the game starts, any, any function that's called start is going to fire off, okay? Any instructions that are inside that container are going to be activated and initialized once the game starts, okay? Let's drill down and talk about some of the uh, specifics of a function. So this right here, inside of the C-sharp language, this kind of defines the word void. This is kind of a good visualization of when a function or where a function's name is, okay? Whenever I see void, I know usually the, the next word is the name of a function. In other programming languages, like, uh, like JavaScript, we'd actually write out function, right? And then we name that function. In C sharp, the word void kind of determines the beginning of the function. And the next word is going to be the name of that function. After the name of our function, we have an open and close parentheses, okay? This is a way for us to exchange information. In my mind, this is kind of like a teleporter in Star Trek. Okay? I can send data from one function to another. And how we do that, the path, is often determined inside of these parentheses. We'll get into that later on in the semester. That's pretty advanced, but we're going to get there. But really, the beginning of our function, which determ what determines the start and the end of our container here, are these two curly braces. Okay? The open curly brace is the beginning of the function. And the closed curly brace naturally is the end, the conclusion of our function. Okay? This is something that we're going to have to manage because the instructions are only going to be evaluated inside the curly braces. All right. So the start function, this happens once at the beginning of every game. The update function, this is a little bit different. The update function happens every frame of the game. Right? Because your game is refreshing at a crazy frame rate, something like 2,000 frames a second or 2,000 update cycles a second, right? So anything that goes in there is constantly going to be evaluated. For me, in my mind, in my imagination, the update function is kind of like a place where we can ask the computer to, for, to listen for things, right? I want you to listen for a key press. Did he hit a button? Did he hit a button? Did he hit a button now? Right? They're, they're questions that the computer's always asking at every single moment in the game. Right? It's a good place for, for content uh, or for, for actions uh, in our update function. However, we're going to write our own function to get our game to work correctly. And uh, to help you guys out, I've actually provided you with all the code that you'll need to do this over inside of Canvas. Um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, let's write our own function. Because we want to have a custom action happen whenever, when, when something happens inside of our game, right? Now, uh, uh, what's the first thing that I need to write to define a function? Void, right? We have to be disciplined. I have failed immediately. <laughs> and I'm going to call mine on mouse down. Okay. Actually, let me pull up my notes. I want to make sure that it's identical to what's on Canvas, just so no one's confused. Yeah, on mouse down. OK. So on mouse down. And check it out. Actually, I'm going to hit undo for a second. Because this is one of the cool things about working inside of Visual Studio. It's a pretty advanced environment. Its sole function is to write code for you, right? And so it knows that, hey, you're writing a function name at the moment. Watch what happens when I hit return. Nice, huh? It automatically adds the open and close parentheses and the open and curl, close curly braces, which is nice. Okay? And Mono Develop, we didn't get any of that love. We had to manually write all that stuff in. Okay? So now, inside of our open and close curly braces, we're, at, we're able to go in and start physically flushing out a command, an action that we need to do. Now, for, uh, for us, what we're going to do is that we're going we're gonna to tell the application, okay? There we go. And I love this about the code hinting that they give us down here. We only need to write a little bit of it. And Visual Studio starts saying, hey, what are you doing? I think you're writing a command that, I f that I'm familiar with. And I want load level. Not loaded level, by the way. So application.load level. And I'm just going to arrow down, load level. Now, we need to tell the computer precisely which level to load. When we do that, Open and close curly braces and then quotes on the inside. And level 01. 
Okay. Now, why did I choose level 01? Because that is physically the exact same name of the scene file that I'm trying to load over in Unity. Okay. So we have got to be very laser specific. Okay. So we're going in and we're saying, hey, load level 1. Capitalization is critical. Okay, it has got to be the exact same way it shows up in the in the editor in your code. Okay, so if you capitalized L, it has to be capitalized over in over in your code as well. Because it's not going to load every level; it's just going to load one. So that's the command. But how do we tell the computer that we're done with the command? That it needs to go on to the next command, a semicolon. Okay, we conclude all commands in C sharp with a semicolon. Okay. All right, that's it. That's actually all we got to do for this one thing. This is that one line of code is going to allow us to load our level. Let me save my script command S. When you save it in here, you don't have to save or you don't have to close down Visual Studio. Actually, I'd recommend that you don't. I hit it. And now if we go back over into Unity, check it out. All that stuff is in there. Aha, great job. This is all me. Those are the elements that I added. So in order for us to get this to work, our script in Unity needs to be a component of a game object that's in my scene, right? It can be on any game object. It really can. Doesn't matter what, okay? Some people they go into their into their hierarchy and they'll go in and they'll create an empty game object and they'll make this like a warehouse for scripts, which is absolutely fine. I've seen people do that a lot. Let's put script Warehouse, just so we kind of know its role. And I'm now going to add that script to my warehouse. Okay? So it needs to be a current member, I'm going to drag it down here, a current member of an existing game object. Okay? It can't exist exclusively inside of your hierarchy. That's not going to work. Okay? All it does is have to live somewhere in your game. Now, in order for us to get this to work correctly, we now have to go back to the text itself. This is the button, remember? I'm inside my canvas. Here's the text. Okay. This is the text component. This just controls how it looks. But in the button component of this, this is where we have to do some work. Okay. And there's, this is very specific to Unity. Uh, we want to take advantage of Unity understanding that our mouse has gone into that box and we're clicking on it. Because once we click, we need to fire off that script. And specifically, we need to fire off a specific function within that script. And there's a couple things in here that we got to do. First and foremost, uh, under uh, not under that, under this on click, okay? It says list is empty. Got to hit the plus sign. And right here, this is the part that we need to change. The first step, okay? So we're going to add a function, and we're going to change it from runtime only to editor and runtime. That way, we can preview it in the editor. We don't have to build our game to see it. Yeah. With a capital L. Yeah, capital L and load. So I'm going to choose this to editor and runtime. Okay. Now the second thing that we have to do, and this is the part that a lot of folks get, that a lot of folks miss, is that we have to load in the game object where the script lives, right? And that's going down here. See how it says object? It's looking for a game object. And I'm simply, here's my script warehouse. This is an empty game object that just has a script on it, just a, some code. And I'm going to left click and drag that down there. Boop. Once that game object is loaded into this part of the editor, now, there it is. Here's the custom. Here it is there, play button controller. And hopefully, if it works, OK, why is it not in here? Because it should say, stop, send message, on mouse down. OK, well, let's, let's figure out why this isn't working. I'm getting an, uh, yeah, I'm getting an error. Yeah, it really doesn't like application load level level 1, because um, this is an older, older code. Does that matter? It may in this version of Unity. Uh, 
Yeah, I have down here. Oh, how do you do it? Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah you, just, you, you, there's two ways. Click it on the target, will bring open your asset browser. And then you can just find the game object that you're looking, script warehouse, and just click on it. Or you can just left click and drag it down there. That's another way of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, because if you look in this add component menu, well, not, you, you, in your script warehouse, you can add a component and then add, uh, not, uh, where is it? There used to be something here that's all called scripts, and you're able to get access to all of your scripts. But dragging and dropping is really all you need to do. So if you, so if you use one empty game object to house all of your scripts, mm -hmm. The name. Oh. The name of the scripts. Okay. You know, in this one, in this version of Unity, they are no longer allowing me to use my old code because this application that load level is old. It's obsolete. Yeah. And in previous version of Unity, even in with C sharp, they're like, you can use it, but it's not the best way, it's not the best command to use. And now it's like, mmm. Yeah, it is. It's and it's that scene manager, and I and I want to make sure I don't have a whole lot of experience with scene manager. Uh, we'll so click I, on it and see if the, the program will offer you a thing. Okay, I, I don't have a whole lot of this experience with scene manager, and I don't want to take everyone down a wrong path at the moment. Um, so I'll tell you what, since we've only got four minutes left, and I've been throwing a curveball, uh, if you want to explore this for your next game or for your next uh, for your next homework assignment. I say go for it, add a simple menu system, but I'll take away the expectation that we have a coded menu working for the next, the next turn in of your prototype, um, and then we'll continue to flush this out and get this working next week because I'm running out of time. I don't want to hold you guys much past the end of class, okay? So ignore for the moment the, the UI component. I'll strip it out of the assignment sheet here in a minute, uh, and we'll continue this party next week. If we return to Unity or Canvas just for a second, as a reminder, okay, so this is, I'll ignore the highlighted blue, right? Polished version of your game next week, please, okay? Finish the prototype. Doesn't have to be fully textured, but everything should have at least some material on it, okay? Free Unity. Second? If you want, I think there are some there's some assets or some folks in here that have assets that you should build over in over in Moto real fast. Right. I mean, yeah. yeah, go beyond basic representation. Get a little bit more specific with the representation of your of your assets. Have a good week, guys. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs>